Hi everybody, just wanted to say before we start playing this interview that I found this interview to be really outstanding. It was a remarkable interview um, and it changed a lot of my perspectives on experiencing Judaism and practicing Judaism and so many concepts that I think religious, non-religious, Jew or non-Jew, uh, a lot of paradigms were shifted through this interview and I think it's incredibly worthwhile, even though it's quite a long interview, I think you'll find it very, very worthwhile to give this a watch. So I encourage you to check it out and just wanted to say from the offset that this is definitely one of my favourite JTV interviews so far. So enjoy. Hello everybody and welcome to JTV. Today we're joined by an extremely special guest. Uh, I would say this is probably one of the most popular uh, Jewish spiritual commentators and advisors online today at the moment. Uh, I'd even say even among no uh, non-Jewish people as well, he's extremely popular, uh, has had a lot of viral videos. And the reason why I'm so excited to have him on JTV is because Rabbi Manis Friedman, who is our guest today, is someone who I feel frames Jewish matters, Jewish values, and spiritual concepts in a way that I feel is so positive, um, healthy, constructive, and I would say he is someone who I feel embodies the verse uh, that is said in Proverbs uh, that, that talks about the ways of the Torah and the ways of Judaism. And it says, we actually say it as we put the Torah away in the Ark on Shabbat mornings, we say, uh, that the Torah's ways are ways of pleasantness and all its paths are peace. And that's what I think of when I listen to Rabbi Friedman. So Rabbi, thank you, first of all, so much for joining us here on JTV today. It is always a pleasure to share good, pleasant, what else, what else, what other word did you use? <laughs> Constructive, healthy, Constructive, balanced. Peaceful. Yes, that is so important. It is so essential to the message. Like Rabbi Akiva said, every word in Torah is about love of a fellow Jew. And if you don't see that, then you're not reading the text correctly. Wow, absolutely. And so you, see, you guys see why I've got this, got, got him on now. Um, so I want to start by talking about something which is actually quite close to home for me. Um, I grew up uh, sort of in a traditional Jewish household and I became uh, more observant and engaged in my Jewish observance throughout my teen years. I decided in my last year of high school that I wanted to go to yeshiva, even though I had really no idea what that meant. And I came across, whether it's through my own uh, Jewish studies, listening to certain uh, sort of extravagant uh, Jewish, uh, you know, speakers or rabbis, um, where you might sometimes hear quite a lot of emphasis among some people and or some some Jewish texts even on the concept of God as a divine punisher, and that when bad things happen, one is meant to examine their actions and 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 think, you know maybe I need to reconsider my ways or, 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 or repent or whatever it is. But I found myself getting into a bit of a dangerous rabbit hole where as certain challenges crept up in my life, as they inevitably will with anyone, I got to a point where I was kind of just, my assumption was this is all punishment and I need to, you know, but I couldn't even figure out what it is that I need to change and I'm trying my best and so I ended up getting into this place of just burnout where I'm feeling I'm trying my best. I'm interpreting things that happen to me as, you know, punishment. I'm saying even to the point where like, if let's say I forgot to say this prayer or that prayer, then if, you know, I got a flat tire, I might think, oh, maybe that's because I didn't do that. And I start, people start creating all these uh, conceptions in, in their heads. And that's what I found happening to me. And I realized that this is, this is just really unhealthy and like on, on all kinds of levels. And it made me re-examine how I'm interpreting God, how I'm understanding this concept of, you know, divine uh, reward and punishment and all that. And um, I, I, that's sort of where I want to start. And I'm happy to share with you more of how, of my, how my journey kind of pr progressed and how I learned it's not necessarily right to approach anything that happens to you in that way. Um, but what, what, what do you think is the right perspective on this? Because I really think a lot of uh, people growing religiously 
can fall down the same kind of path, go down the same kind of path that I went down. And, and how do you reconcile that with the fact that we're supposed to assume and believe that gamzu Teva, everything that's happening is for the good and no bad comes from above. Isn't that a great contradiction? Well, I'll tell you why, I'll tell you how I, recon how I reconciled it. Because I'll, I'll tell you the, 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 the few things that I was hearing. Number one, I was hearing that, you know, we say in the Musaf Amida uh, on the festivals, because of our sins, we're exiled from our land. I was hearing on Rosh Hashanah, Teshuvah, Tefillah, Tzedakah, your actions will change what, what Hashem does with you. Um, I was hearing in the Talmud, it says, if something bad comes your way, examine your actions. That's what I was hearing. And so I felt maybe there is something to this. And what do we do with the fact that no bad comes from Hashem and Hashem is all the essence of goodness and, and everything is for the good? So let's, let's first take a look at the whole concept of reward and punishment. It's a big subject, right? It's one of the 13 principles of faith, that for every mitzvah there's a reward and for every sin there's a punishment. And then we look in Pirkei Avos and we are told, do not serve your master like a servant who serves for sake of a reward, serve like the servant who serves, who serves without sake of reward. So you keep telling me what the reward is, and I'm supposed to keep ignoring it. So if I'm not doing it for the reward, and I shouldn't do it for the reward, that makes a lot of sense, that doing it for the reward is actually worshiping the reward and not God himself. Shouldn't that apply to not suffering punishment? Is that not a reward? Is that not one of the benefits? So if I do my mitzvahs and I'm very careful not to sin because I don't want to suffer, who am I serving? Myself, right? It's self-serving. So where is Ivdu es Hashem? And I ask this question to yeshiva people, to rush yeshivas, to teachers, to rabbis, where is the Ivdu es Hashem? If every mitzvah is to my benefit and avoidance of sin is to keep me protected and, and, and safe, where is the Ivdu Es Hashem? And they don't know. Can you just translate Ivdu Es Hashem for our viewers? Because some might not be familiar. You mean serving God? Serve God with joy. That's the essence of, of all the mitzvahs. And yet if I'm doing it because it's best for me and God is just giving me good advice and I'm accepting the good advice, does that mean I'm serving him? He's serving me, guiding me, protecting me, giving me wisdom. But it's all about me. This can't be. This cannot be. And even the emphasis on suffering in the, in the hereafter, suffering after 120 years, is that not a little narcissistic? And what exactly is the suffering in the, in, in the world to come? Why would it be narcissistic? I'm just protecting myself. I'm, it's like a good insurance policy. I want to make sure that after I pass away, things go smoothly. It's an insurance policy. So in what way am I serving God? Well, let's ask the question a little differently. What does it even mean to serve God? To serve him means to do something for him. <laughs> what could I do for him? He needs nothing. He is perfect. He is infinite. He is eternal. He is all-knowing and almighty. <laughs> what am I going to do for him? Buy him another tie? 
you know, where do you get the guy who's got everything? <laughs> so the whole notion of serving God seems impossible to begin with. Which may lead many people to the conclusion that it must be for my benefit. He can't do anything for him. And yet, serve God with joy is such a central principle in, in the entire Torah. You, co you quoted about we were exiled because of our sins. But there's also a quote that says there's going to be an exile and the reason will be because you didn't serve God with joy. But what does it mean to serve him? So we're making some very fundamental mistakes. And they're terrible. They're terrible. Like speaking of God's perfection. The more we speak of how perfect he is, the less lovable he is. The less approachable he is the more impossible it becomes to serve him. So is God affected in any way by what I do or don't do? The conventional wisdom is not affected at all. So it must be for my benefit. So I'm really just serving myself and I'm really grateful that 3,333 years ago, God gave us the Torah, which tells us how to do what's best for ourselves. But since then, we really have no relationship with him. And yet, every day, twice a day, three times a day, we quote from the Torah, you should love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. He's not lovable, he's not approachable, he's not reachable. <laughs> so this is an impossible situation. So I had an interesting little incident. I got a phone call from a guy from Israel. I don't know him, he doesn't know me. He was desperate. His 12 year old daughter had gotten it into her head that God was angry at her and she's miserable. They tried everything and no one could help. Everyone was trying to convince her that God was not angry with her, but she wouldn't budge. So without warning, he puts her on the telephone and says, here, talk to her. So having no choice, I said to her, God is angry at you? She says, yes. I said, I'm so jealous. <laughs> she says, why? I said, because you're 12 years old and you can do something to get God angry? How did you become so important? <laughs> the problem was over. If, if God is angry at us, is that not the biggest compliment in the world? We can affect him. He who needs nothing, who is perfect and infinite and, and eternal. There's something I can do that can affect him and get him angry. Then obviously this is not all for my benefit. If it's for my benefit and I don't do it, he should just have pity on me, not get angry. So the very notion that God gets angry with us is such a compliment to us and it changes our entire view and understanding of him. Wow. So he, he gets angry when we sin, but he gets no pleasure when we do a mitzvah. He's, he's unreachable? Well, I can get him angry. Yeah, anger, but that's about it. He's just one angry guy. <laughs> that's terrible. So let's, let's try this and get right to the punchline. 
we've been laboring under a misconception, a terrible misconception that goes against the grain of every word in Torah. You ready for this one? Since the beginning of creation, we have been told that we, the created beings, even God's chosen people, the apple of his eye, we are so needy, we are so weak, we are so vulnerable, we are so dependent. We must pray every day just for the privilege of living. We need his kindness and his compassion because we can't, we can't do anything without him. On and on, we are told this in a thousand different ways. And then, like you say, if something goes wrong that I don't like, well, now I'm being punished. I'm not good enough to get a favor from him. So now I have to get down on my knees, in a manner of speaking, and beg and plead and promise to be good and do a thorough tshuva, then maybe he'll like me a little bit and do me a favor and help me with my needy weaknesses. What a depressing picture. <laughs> it's horrible. It is horrible. And then we're supposed to love him? Look, he did this to us, right? He put us in this condition. And then says, watch your step. You do something wrong, you're going to suffer. And then we're told to love him with all your heart. That's like being told to love your abuser. Absolutely. I, I, just to pause you for one second, just to express how I feel this, this is, is somewhat right, widespread in all religious communities, not just Jewish, but all. I, I once, you know, when I was going through this challenge that I, that I referenced earlier, you know, just in my post yeshiva days, I remember there was a middle tier religious figure um, who said to me, you know, Ollie, if you just, um, you know, examine your actions a bit more, maybe try a bit more, then maybe, maybe it, you'll, you'll get the Yeshua that, that you need, the, 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 the healing or change, whatever it is that you need. And to me, I, it was utterly depressing to hear that and, and, and demotivating. It's sort of vic like victim blaming almost. Then on the other hand, there's another terrible problem with it because it makes it sound like my needs are, are sacred. You have to get what you need. You must find a way to get what you need. So beg, plead, promise, do anything you can. You must fulfill your needs. And that occupies my mind day and night. There's no room for God. My needs are paramount. And he's only here to fulfill my needs. I just got to push the right button to get the right response. It is such a depressing, negative picture and so not Jewish. Transactional. It's so Catholic. <laughs> I mean, if you think about the Catholic idea, uh, God loves you so much that he sacrificed his son to gain forgiveness for you so that you can get to heaven. You know, I got a better idea. Don't create me and don't kill your son. What kind of sick plan is this? You create me in sin so that I can't get to heaven, so that your son has to die for me to get to heaven. Don't create me. Don't take me to heaven. What is all this? What makes this whole thing necessary? Nothing. It's a ridiculous plan. So look, look at what is really true. Bereshis bara elikim es hashamayim es ha'aretz. In the beginning, God created heaven and earth. I know enough. That will keep me going for the rest of my life. The rest is commentary. 
Those are such enlightening words. In the beginning, in other words, before there was me with my problems, God created the world. You know, God, you know, infinite, eternal, all-powerful, almighty. He created the world. The obvious question is, for what? He is already perfect. He is God. Can't get better than that. So why did he create a world? So the rabbis come along and they say, well, he didn't need to. He didn't need to. I'm not interested. God creates an entire universe that he does not need. I quit right there. You're already sounding senseless. So then I say, what, he created the world without a purpose? He said, oh, no, of course he's got a purpose. Oh, he has a purpose, but no need. Now he has a purpose that he doesn't need. <laughs> You're making him sound so ridiculous. It's, it's a shul Hashem. It's, it's blasphemous. So right there in the first words of the Torah, in the beginning, God created heaven and earth. It tells me two of the most important things anyone ever needs to know. Number one, he created. Don't tell me he doesn't need anything. And number two, it was in the beginning, before there was me, before I needed anything. So it's not about me. Now take a look at reality and see how much, how much more beautiful and meaningful it's become. Only a creator has needs. Only a creator. The created being has no needs. Where do I get needs from? I was created the way he needs me to be, in his image. But I have needs and he doesn't. No. He has a divine need. I am created in his image, so I have things that look like needs, <laughs> which are not mine. I have no needs. Thank you very much. And I think we've come to this realization universally. Late in history, like in the last year or so, where all over the world suddenly people are saying, I didn't ask to be born. And they're not depressed or suicidal. <laughs> they're just making an observation. I didn't ask to be born. Did you? Even children are saying it. Ten-year-olds, put your, put your things away in the shelf. Why do I have to? I didn't ask to be born. <laughs> and the parents panic and take them to a, to a psychiatrist and put them on, on antidepressants. No, don't do that. Just tell your ten-year-old that you didn't ask to be born either. I actually saw a funny video last week where someone said, par parents say to me like, oh, you know, we fed you, we gave you a shelter under, you know, for you, a roof under you, for you to live under. He said, isn't that your job? Isn't that what you're supposed to do? Like, you chose to have me. <laughs> so a guy in India last year took his parents to court, literally took them to court, suing them to pay all his bills for the rest of his life because he gave birth, they gave birth to him without his consent. Are you serious? Yep. <laughs> Unfortunately for him, both his parents are lawyers. <laughs> he lost, they threw it out of court. But when you think about it, he's got a very good point. I never signed any agreements. How did I become responsible to pay bills? 
No, not just pay bills. I got to get up early in the morning to go to school. And I have to get good grades and I got to get into a good college and I got to get a good job and I got to make a lot of money so that I can pay for my house and my trips and my, and my kids' tuitions. I have to do that? And nobody even asked me? And I never agreed to any of this? That's nasty. <laughs> it's, like, it's like you take me to a very expensive restaurant and give me the best things in the restaurant and then tell me to pay for it. I'm not paying for it. And the same is true with God. God puts me in this world without asking me. I never agreed to it. And now God says, you better watch it. You got to earn your way into heaven. So wait a minute. I don't need this. No, no, you need to keep kosher and you need to be good and you need to give charity and you need to... No, no, I don't need anything because I didn't need to be born. That is such a fundamental basic truth. I don't need to be here. And I don't see what I gain by being here. At best... I will go back to where I came from. What's the deal? I don't need anything. The, the need that has driven people since the beginning of history was the need to not die. Well, guess what? It's not working anymore. You can't threaten people anymore like that, especially young people. Now they're telling people, don't do drugs. It can kill you. And every teenager is like waiting for the punchline. Yeah, so what's your point? The threat doesn't work anymore. And it shouldn't because it makes absolutely no sense to live the best life I can live so that I don't die. And why do you think we, people have come to that, these, these feelings now in history? Is it to do with, we have physical abundance, so there's nothing for us to be focusing on as much perhaps, or I, I don't know, I'm just speculating. I think very simply, death is not so imminent as it used to be. Mm. Every farmer's kid knows if the rains don't come, we're going to starve. It's very simple. If we don't get the seeds in on time, there will be no crop and we will die. Tell a kid today, if you don't go to school, you're going to die. <laughs> what? <laughs> so it, it lost its power. But also, it's probably a step before the coming of Mashiach. There's got to be a major shift in, in, in people's mentality, in the psyches, to enter into a Mashiachic world rather than the exile world that we've, been, that we've been used to. So here's the picture. I am not needy. I don't need to eat. I have to because I was created that way. It was not my idea. I don't like it. I don't need it. I don't want it. But I have no choice. I tried going without food. Lasted about two hours. <laughs> Try going without sleep. I don't need to sleep. It's such a waste of time. But I can't. Who did this to me? My creator. So they're not my needs. They're imposed on me. So precisely, correctly stated, it's his need that I eat. It's his need that I sleep. Otherwise, I wouldn't do it. On the other hand, he created the entire world because he needs me. Put those two things together and you have Judaism. 
That's the entire Torah. God gathers, at, at, gathers us at Har Sinai, at Mount Sinai, and he says, can I tell you what I need? That's the Torah. I need you to honor your father and mother. I need you to, to not work on Shabbos. I need you to not kill or steal or commit adultery. This is me. This is my need. So on the one hand, I am no longer needy. On the other hand, I am essential. I am needed. That's it. That's it. The rest is commentary. I think also today, our neediness has gone way too far. It is such a heavy burden and it is so depressing. Our needs, they're just endless. Just when you think you have everything you need, a new product comes on the market, which you must have. <laughs> it's to die for. And other such pretty expressions. <laughs> so, Psychology that was supposed to give us some relief only adds to our burden. You come to the psychiatrist or psychologist and you say, I can't take this anymore. The needs, they just don't end. I can never relax. I can't stop. I can't. I can't. And what does the, psycho the psychologist do? Say, no, no, no. You think you know what you need, but what you really need is your mother's approval because she never wanted you. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> you're so helpful. Also, you're jealous of your brother and uh, you were traumatized as a kid. So you need to heal and you need therapy for the next 10 years. No, no. I'm looking to unburden. Don't burden me more. So then I run to religion. I say, come on, God is going to help me. God will take care of my needs. Oh, yeah? <laughs> you go to religion and you discover that your needs will not end when you die. <laughs> They're going to follow you into heaven and plague you there. So is there no help? Is there no escape? Once you hear this, it is so intuitively true. I don't have needs because I don't need to be here at all. Then why am I here? Because I am needed, not needy. Idolatry doesn't mean bow down to a statue you just finished making out of stone or wood. That's absurd. Idolatry means only a creator has a need. When you start claiming that you have needs, that's idolatry. You're not God. Knock it off. You are not entitled to needs. Only a creator has needs. Let me give you a quick little incident. This boy from New York goes off to France to yeshiva. He arrives, he goes straight to the office and he says to the dean of the yeshiva, I need to call my mother, which phone can I use? This was back before everybody had their own phone. And the dean of the yeshiva, to his utter surprise, mimics him and says, I need to call my mother. The boy was very surprised. The dean of the yeshiva was known to be a very deep, profound, pious individual. So he says, yes, I, I need to call my mother. And the dean says again, I need to call my mother. So thinking quickly, to the boy's credit, he realized what the dean was saying. 
So he says, no, no, no. My mother needs me to call her. Which phone can I use? And the dean said, good. That was your first lesson. You need to call your mother? First of all, that isn't even true. No teenage boy needs to call his mother. <laughs> Unless he's run out of money. <laughs> Secondly, you need to call your So go find a phone. Nobody, nobody is obligated to do your work for you. Your mother needs you to call and you're going to call? Okay, that, that's, first of all, true. Your mother is sitting at the phone waiting for it to ring. And secondly, that's nice. That's noble. Yes, I'll help you. Here's a phone. Same is true with God and Judaism. The religious father says to his son, wake up, you have to go to shul. Kid says, I have to? Yeah. The kid says, I thought about it, and it uh, seems to me that I don't have to. <laughs> I don't have to. Oh, you must. Uh, no. <laughs> yes. And you have to keep Shabbos, and you have to keep kosher, and you have to, you have to put on your tefillin, and you have to go to the mikveh. Have... And the kid says, what do you mean I have to? I don't have to. I don't need it. I don't. And here, watch. <laughs> I'm not going to do any of that, and I'm going to be fine. So what are you saying? Invariably, inevitably, the father is going to say, you know, if you don't do it, you're going to suffer. You're going to burn in hell. Which only convinces the son that he's right. Because when you have to resort to a threat, it means you have nothing more to say. Who's right, the father or the son? This, this happens in every family, you know, uh, consciously or unconsciously, verbally or non-verbally. This is the conversation between every religious parent and their child. And the child is right. I don't have to. When did I become responsible? When did I become responsible? You created me. And now it's my job? Nope. That is not Judaism. That's other religions. You must. Because if you don't, you'll suffer. And if you do, you will be rewarded. And we are told right from the beginning of Perkei Avot, don't do the mitzvah for the sake of a reward. Well, if not for the sake of a reward, then why? Don't do it for the reward because you don't really need the reward. You don't need anything. And yet you should do it because... That's what is needed of you. Now you're serving God. You're doing what he needs. Without thought of a reward. And, and if you do that, you will be happy. But if you're taking care of your needs, you will never be happy. So there it is. There's your choice in life. Not to be good or bad. That's a, that's a silly choice. The choice is, do you see yourself as needy or as needed? The rest is commentary. Now, when I say this to people who know a little bit, who have learned a little bit, they go, they go ballistic. No, God does not need. You can't say that. God can't have needs. Well, first of all, if you create a universe with a purpose, 
then you have a need. Unless you are so frivolous. There was this bar, little bar mitzvah boy I was talking to. And I said, you know, God, God needs you to put on tefillin. He says, why do you say he needs? He, he just wants. I said, you think God wants things he doesn't need? Well, you could argue, just as from putting my philosopher hat on, is it maybe maybe as human beings we can't conceive of uh, creating things without a need, but maybe in the heavenly sphere such a thing can be done. Just just putting that out there as devil's advocate. That is possible, but but philosophically that's kind of nihilistic. It's like. Maybe he doesn't need any of this, and maybe we don't really exist, and maybe there is no truth to anything. And by the way, I think a lot of people also would, to add to this retaliation, they might say the first words God utters to the very first Jew, lech lecha, go for yourself, you know, uh, focused on Abraham's, this will be good for you, Abraham, you know, rather than good for God. But who is saying that? God. So if God gets angry at me, that's a huge compliment. If God is giving me good advice, that's another huge compliment. Why does he bother doing this? So people say, he didn't create the world for his need. He created the world for you. Because that's, you know, he's a nice guy and he likes to do favors. He likes to do favors. Looks to me like he needs to do favors if he bothers to create the entire universe just to do you a favor. So maybe his need is to do you a favor, but it's his need. The word need sounds like a weakness because human needs are weaknesses. And the reason it's a weakness for the human being is because it isn't ours. The need to eat is a weakness because it's not my need. If it was my need, it would make me stronger. But no, it makes me weaker because it's not about me. So the need to eat doesn't make me more real, more purposeful, more, more valid. No, it makes me weaker. So when we say God needs, we assume that it's the same kind of need. But the opposite is true. His need is a real need. A real need is not a weakness. It's a purposefulness. <coughs> As with everything else. We have kindness. God's kindness is much more real. We have some strength. God's strength is much more real. It's like my granddaughter was crying because her doll broke. The, the, the arm came out. So I sit down and I say, I can't imagine how much that hurt. Oh, the poor doll. So she starts to laugh and she says, it didn't hurt. I said, what do you mean it didn't hurt? The arm came off. She says, it's not a real arm. I said, how do you know? She says, it's plastic. I said, All right. right, what was I thinking? A plastic arm is not a real arm. A real arm has to have a bone and skin and muscle. That's a real arm. Actually, is that a real arm? It's just a bone with skin on it. What makes it a real arm? God has a real arm. It's written everywhere in the Torah. God's arm, his right arm. He stretched out his arm. 
He has a real arm. Real, literal. We have something like an arm because we were created in his image. But our arm is, <laughs> it's puny. The same is true with speech. Does God really speak? I mean, he doesn't even have a mouth. We speak, he doesn't. You see how backwards this is? God really speaks. We babble. Because <laughs> we're created in his image, so we kind of mimic him. But he said, let there be light, and there was light. <laughs> I say at home, let's have some quiet, and nothing happens. <laughs> Doesn't change anything. So who really speaks? We've got this so backwards. It is so twisted. Everything about God is the real thing. We are the, 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 the metaphor. What is that word? What is that word? Um, anth anthropomorphic, right? People say, when the Torah says God's arm, it's anthropomorphic. It's attributing a human quality to the divine. That is not Jewish. The truth is that when we say God's arm, we are being diopomorphic. We're attributing divine properties to the human being because our arm should not really be called an arm. It's theopomorphic. Our speech should not be called speech. So God's need, of course he has need. And only his need is the real one, the valid one. My needs, they change every half hour. So you see, we, we've twisted everything so upside down.